Hello, everyone. Uh, especially hello, Gunil. First of all, I wanted to uh, thank the um, the Norway Embassy because the, this is a collaboration that we started uh, last month when we presented the the painter and the thief, which is nom nominated to the Oscar this year, and um, and we continue now with this uh, selection of short. I also want to thank the um, the Norwegian Film Institute because they helped me to pick up the you know all the shorts. And uh, I really feel that these shorts represent the world. The, the, the variety of the films that we presented tonight is amazing because really we, we, we're covering everything, you know, from the, I was saying from the, uh, the affected, which is really about refugees, dep deportation. So everything that has to do with the flow of immigration. And, and then, uh, you know, the, the, your film, it's about the pandemic. So it's, it's more relevant than ever. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, Adora, which is about, again, the uh, gender issues, you know, being female, wanting to play football in a Muslim country, and so, so many, you know, different aspects of, of that. And, uh, well, for, for um, the Pearl Diver, I have to say that it's such a poetic, incredibly poetic film. I, I'm just really amazed at what you did for Greta, really it was wonderful. And, uh, and then to, to finish the, um, the, the, the last film, which is about Europe. So about Brexit, about, you know, the, the way we, we believe we are or, you know, we behave. Uh, so there, there are lots of issues out there that, you know, we definitely want to discuss a bit. So um, I, I would like to start just, just because of the, uh, the order we presented, I would like to start with um, Jakob. Is, is that the way you pronounce your name? Oh, yeah. Jakob. Perfect, yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Uh, so um, yes, if you want to tell us a bit about how you started uh, working as a filmmaker and what, why did you pick up that theme, special theme, you know, for your film? How, how I started out just at way back or? Uh, well, uh, yeah, well, the, just the inspiration to become a filmmaker and, and to, you know, just, yes. For me, it was just like when I was a kid that loved films uh, and I would would borrow my father's like you know crappy camcorder and just shoot stuff. So it's always been there, and um, and uh, yeah, that that was the starting point. And then it's just kept kept going. I think I, I guess that's similar to how most people start out. It's it's uh, you gravitate towards something early on, and then you just either stick with it or you don't. <laughs> So, so that that was it for me. And then um, uh, Apocalypse Norway was. Um, uh, uh, I mean, it started out as a collab collaboration with the composer. Actually, that was someone I wanted to work with, uh, and um, and we. Uh, it was originally meant to be part of uh, an uh, an anthology feature film from one short film from each of the Nordic countries. Um, and that project doesn't seem to, I mean, I've, I can't talk too much about it because probably it won't happen. But for me, it was still an opportunity to just sort of to, to do something that I hadn't done before, which was to tell a, a more kind of mythological little story about uh, the lives that we live now. That, that was kind of the starting point um, to develop the project and also working with that composer. So that led to a project where, I mean, for me, the, the jumping off point in terms of trying to tell a modern mythology about Norway was, was the idea that we, that we live these lives that are, well, some of, some, some of Norway do anyway, or as a society we do, that, that's, that's rather privileged. I mean, it's the society is composed of many people and many layers, but as a society, we're fairly privileged on the world stage. And I think we, we tend to tell ourselves these stories about how the, the pain of the world and the, the, whatever crisis crises erupt in the world is not gonna actually affect Norway. I think that's a kind of national collective myth of sorts. And uh, I wanted to do a little story where, where you put, put that sort of illusion up against a danger that doesn't really know any boundaries or any uh, doesn't stop at the border between two countries. So, so that was the starting point. And then 
um, and and I looked at different scenarios, but but uh, a, a, a pandemic, unfortunately, you know, it, it, the, the odds are pretty pretty big, and um, but we had obviously no. I mean, we we were in late stages of post production end of twenty nineteen. So as COVID was starting to happen, we were rather shocked by the obviously, uh, and. Um, and it's it's strange how it overlaps in certain respects. Um, just even like the newscast, newscast where we talk about like border shutting and and stuff like that, which is just like a quick shot of a of a laptop in the film, um, seemed seemed you know weirdly in line with what was happening. But the other thing I think that was special for me with this project, for for good or bad, maybe. Was that was the working start as a, having a starting point, uh, working with a composer and trying to work on themes rather than start with the characters, which I I often tend to do. So so for me it was less about like making all the plot points or all the twists and turns as clear as possible. It was more about trying to build and sustain a certain mood, and to to allow for the music to take as much space as possible and. Hopefully, eventually, I'll get to have a couple of screenings in a cinema, and then we can, because the sound design is really heavy when it's played on on a proper sound setup. Good. No, no, it's definitely a very atmospheric film. It's it's very much about the the environment, and it's a collective film. So, no, I, I was just curious because you know, of course, you ask lots of questions while you watch the people acting, and it really starts from a, a, a very privileged kind of background I mean you can tell you know it's a beautiful house you know this group of people are all beautiful you know they're all privileged and then all of a sudden things unravel uh, so but yeah it's definitely uh, uh, you know atmospheric you know to say the least so it's definitely really really wonderful yes um, so uh, well I I know that you're working also on a new project right now are you working on a, on a feature film yeah, so we're actually um, we're gonna lock lock the edit on Friday, so that, so that's why I couldn't join earlier tonight. But so um, yeah, if I end up rambling at one point, that's because I'm, I'm not sleeping at the moment. But uh, okay. but yeah, we we're, we're, we're locking it on Friday, so we we shot that, and that again was like we managed to shoot it in a tiny window uh, last year, September and October before while while the pandemic was sort of calming down in Norway and in Oslo and then just the day after we we wrapped it just poof, spiked again yeah and and things were locking back down so so um so yeah so fingers crossed this we'll be able to finish it completely yeah yeah this, well, this well, it, it was the same in London September October they were pretty much uh, um out and about and then all of a sudden November was all shut down then we opened up for two weeks and then we closed down so I mean yeah it's been very uh, upheaval for everybody I guess but uh, you know I wish you all the best with your project. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay so um, we'll go to um, uh, following the order we go to uh, Mar Margrethe is that right? Okay yes yes it's a really nice pronunciation <laughs> well, good. well, I'm Italian, so I pronounce every single vowel, so I guess you do the same probably. Yes, in the yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. So, um, Margrethe, uh, yes, I mean, we, we already met at the very beginning, and um, I just want to, um, to, to know a bit about, um, again, your, your background, and especially um, the story, how you invent the story, because your stories are just so creative, you know, they just come out of uh, observation, they come out of reading books, so, you know, how, how do you get the inspiration for your stories? Um, it's a big question, and I think it has many answers, and... Um, but I think that it's uh, it starts with some images, and um, it started. This film started with a, a sentence, and it was a shaved hedgehog. A friend said that word or that sentence, and I thought it was very funny. Why would a hedgehog be shaved? And I thought it was something very vulnerable about it. And I started to to think about why he would shave. And I thought maybe to 
maybe he feels dangerous and wants something that is fragile and maybe a balloon and he wants to hug a balloon so that's the conflict and I made that story that he shaves and he uh, get to hug the balloon but it's hard to maintain this they grow out again the spikes he can't kind of uh, keep up with his big change it's his nature he can't go against himself and then in the end realizing he has to let go is a very mature choice I think and then there is the other two stories they kind of the, fur, the penguin and the polar bear came as an image as well. It was uh, uh, about uh, communication and like if you're close with someone and you don't really know what you're talking about. You're not on the same level, but you really, yeah, you're stuck together. And then maybe when you get some air and some separation, you start to understand more what is the other person about. And uh that was the kind of grounds for developing that story. And uh, the oysters are just, uh, it just appeared <laughs> when I, I had to find a third story. And that uh, it was just a little picture I scribbled and my supervisor said, ah, oh, maybe this one, you should, there is something here about these two oysters. And I was thinking about that when couples are maybe not they're kind of harmonious but they're not on the same page and like overall the three stories they're just showing three different relationships coming to an end so I want to show and explore that uh, you you have human relationships in different ways and you're um, you're bound to uh, have some kind of suffering when you open up to someone else. So it's a, it's a pessimistic approach to kind of accept how the world, how life is both where it, like, it's not perfect. That's what I want to say. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a question though. So at a certain point, the, the, this big white bear, you know, uh, drives with the motor, you know, with the boat, you know, goes near the, the penguin and then leaves again. And the penguin is actually showing uh, a pearl. So mm -hmm. how that fit in? Uh... That's about the different expectations, I think, that you, uh, it's this, this way of thinking something is perfect that the penguin just think, oh yeah, he just needed some space, but actually the polar bear never liked the penguin. So it's about kind of being hard and realistic about that things aren't always as you want it to be. And to, to show that um, if, if you see that in the end credits, you see the polar bear is, that, is sitting all alone, but he's on his side of the ice flake so maybe he's also kind of longing for the penguin. So it's not black and white either, like who is bad and who is good. And I think it's very interesting to observe how people are and what makes them how they are. And is it different traumatic experiences that are causing them to behave a certain way or, and also the, yeah, dynamics that happens in couples relationships and who is to the one who is the victim, who is the, uh, what's the opposite of a victim? I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Right on. Killer. laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, Trying no. to make it quite uh, universal and not, yeah, seeing some different topics. Sure. No, no, that, that's very interesting. <laughs> hi, hi, Gunil. Uh, so, yes, uh, well, so you represent Europe in this uh, panel. <laughs> Nothing less. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, because we, as I was saying, we cover so many different subjects, and in your case, definitely you, you were, um, you know, dealing with what we mean by Europe, and, and uh, so you, you pull together this, uh, this game. Does that exist, or it was just completely fantasy? Uh, no, it's, it's completely fantasy, but like, uh, I suppose the fun fact is that we did some, we did quite a lot of research actually, and, and involving a trip to Brussels, 
and um, yeah, interviewing people working in the EU system. And when we uh, talked to people working with ed education, they actually said, we want this game. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's like a thin line. I said, not the exact game that we had in the, in the film, but like the, the theory or the idea of it. Sure, yeah, they're, they're pulling everybody together. And also there was a mention in the film about Berlusconi. I didn't follow that. Or all of a sudden I saw the name of it. Yeah, no, let me tell you about that as well, because um, that, that's just an anecdote that happened when we were in Brussels. We met this uh, uh, assistant of a German MP uh, eating his uh, lunch outside the um, parliament. And he, um, he had managed to sneak us into the parliament because actually you need to have like um, an appointment and stuff. And we didn't, but we had our passports, which we needed. Weirdly, we were going around without passports, but anyway, and we got in and, and he gave us a tour and then he, he showed us one of the sculptures that was in the sculpture court, like in the middle of the parliament and he said like, uh, and it was a big uh, Trojan horse. And he's like, do you know who gave this, you know, to the parliament? No. And then, oh, it was Berlusconi. Uh, like a, a huge Trojan horse sculpture inside the, the EU parliament, you know, it's, it's not subtle, it's nothing near subtleness, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's like rolling a line. about Berlusconi whatsoever. <laughs> yes, but it's just like, Jesus, this is happening, it's like, a, it's a world stage, you know, it's like Roman times. Mm. Uh, so, um, so I just tried to collect, um, uh, stories and also the thing about the tattoo uh, I, I got inspired by a book uh, that, that said something it was also about the EU and and something with um, yeah uh, uh, sort of uh, tattooing in the bruise and um, and uh, or, yeah so it's like I don't know we just tried to to find various things that say something uh, about the, I don't know, a union or a consistency that doesn't really have a personality or it doesn't really, it's, it's difficult to pinpoint. It's not that it's not useful and, and good in many ways, but it's bureaucracy to us, you know? And I just find it uh, fun to to play around with it and make jazz of it, basically. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. No, definitely, it's very satirical. For example, when the, the, the guy try to, to speak, like the French guy tries to... <laughs> <laughs> make themselves understood so, so again you know languages barriers and and, uh, and and borders you know to the people that don't understand each other so it's yeah interesting yeah and this is another thing that i thought it was fun just like yeah again you know you talked about privileged earlier and, and stuff and and we don't i mean you don't grow up learning a lot about the eu uh, in norway not specifically at least but but what I remember mostly when the EU kind of came about was the Erasmus um, program. You know, the fact that we actually could join the Erasmus program because I was, you know, I was coming into uh, starting to study or, or thinking about starting to study. Oh, you know, I can do exchanges. How fun, you know, it's a kind of that, that, that was the only <laughs> kind of concept of the, of the EU. That, I think for uh, most countries, Erasmus was actually the best part of the EU. <laughs> Especially for young people and students in the yeah, university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it is a good thing, yeah. But it's what you, what as you, when you're a young person, there's maybe everything you know about it or relate to it anyway. Sure, yes, absolutely. Well, I think it's, it's time probably now to open up a bit. Is there any, any question, uh, uh, Mia? Is there anybody that wants to, uh, uh, to ask directly something? Uh, it's probably your, your chance now. I could actually ask a question if, if I may, because <laughs> it seems like, well, I've, I've spotted kind of like um, when Jakob was talking about uh, working with a, with a composer. So I wanted to ask you first, kind of like, was it something new for you that you, you built a short film around um, a desire to collaborate with a, with a composer or, or do you kind of, how do you, how do you normally approach it and how important is sound in your, uh, in your work? Um, I, I think I think sound and sound and picture and music kind of share share an equal importance in in cinema. Um, but I've never I've never started a project from <clears throat> from the from the point of view of uh, um, 
of st or starting it with a composer. Mm -hmm. So that was the first. Um, and I think what it did as well was that it it kind of allowed me to to tell the story in a different way and to kind of I kind of decided that the, the tone of the music would would because I just really like his music and I um, uh, Andre Bratton is his name and 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 his music is so sort of dark and cold and melancholic um, which is probably a bit different from other things that I've been working on. So I kind of allowed myself to just just let let that be a guiding star in a way for the project. So, and he's he's a he's a real misanthrope. Like he's he's when I first met him and talked to him about the project, he was just like super skeptical. And um, and then I told him about the idea, and then he was like, "Well, you know, I just wake up every morning hoping there's no people in the world." And so he's uh, he's terrible. <laughs> he can be good fun, but his worldview is very very dark, and uh, mine isn't really necessarily. I uh, I'm quite sort of hopeful at heart. So I thought that was interesting to sort of like let the, let the music sort of push me in a certain direction in this project. But I think it's important for any project, but usually. And I usually do find a composer before I shoot so that I can have some music leading up to the shoot that also informs it. But in this case, that was the very starting point rather than rather than something that was introduced later in the process. I actually answered uh, my follow up question about about the, the, the composer, kind of his view on the on the uh, project. So thank you for that. <laughs> he beat me to it. Um, and yeah, it's, it's quite interesting how you say uh, you're, you're kind of like a hopeful and positive person. And he's rather kind of like not not putting him in a box, but kind of more like a pessimist. So so it's it's interesting to kind of have that that balance of light and dark. Which uh, how did how did you find uh, how did you find that? Oh, it was great. I mean, it, it was a really good synergy. But it, he kind of just panicked every now and then, like he'd just be on the phone with him and he'd suddenly be like, I can't do something happy. And I'm like, I'm not asking you to calm down. Oh. And uh, no, it was, it, was a, it was a good synergy. And I think, I think but I think anything, any, any creative pursuit that involves more than one person ultimately has to be that. So um, same with the cinematographer and you know, production designer, um, editor all of those kind of like creative heads of departments. And there's obviously more than that as well. Um, sound designer on this one was really important. And he's actually someone who's, uh, his name is Christian Sconning. And he's in some of his previous work because he used to live in LA and he's worked with someone like um, uh, Michael Bay, like I think on one of his Transformers films, um, which is a completely different world to mine. But 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 he has a particular way of like talking about sound and working with sound, and something comes out of that when 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 you approach it from slight opposites, mm -hmm. and um, um, yeah. So so I think anything anything in filmmaking is always about. I mean when when I I mean just to make a broader point and maybe maybe <laughs> stop rambling it's just that whenever I look for people to work with on on a project I always try to find the right resistance I always try to find people that are opposites in a way or or where you share certain tastes that's always important but if there's a level of opposition something better will come out of it rather than you just thinking just sticking with your own ideas if you can if you can early on in the process just put yourself in a position where you're forced to sort of like move around your yeah. so you're clearly like a challenge then right yeah. absolutely yeah, yeah. It, uh, i mean you already told us about your plans but now we want to have a title and and a bit of a, uh, some hint of the story of this new film that you're working on is that possible yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, actually, the title is a nightmare. I don't know if it's going to change. The title might change, actually. Right now, it's called uh, Thomas in... No, sorry, no, it's kept changing. It's now called Thomas in the Multiverse. Oh. And and a very like brief pitch is that it's about um, a young professor in quantum physics who is working on a theory and basically chasing some insane dream about winning winning the Nobel Prize and at the same time his his intimate relationships his 
ex-wife, his son, his mother, they kind of all need him in their life. And, and his life is falling apart <clears throat> around him while he's chasing this idea. And it's, uh, I'd say it's a drama film with a lot of humor baked into it uh, and an intimate story about the family in crisis, but, but told through the prism of some, some wild uh, ideas in quantum physics. Yeah, so. nice, nice title too, Thomas and the Multiverse, right? That's it for now. Yeah, it's changed topics <laughs> at least three times already, so we'll yeah. see. Okay, let's go back to uh, Margarita. Can you tell us a bit about um, your new project? What you're working on now? Uh, yes, it's a short film as well. It's called Bear Hug, and it's uh, um, uh, similar maybe to Pearl Diver in the sense it's uh, human problems and uh, some psychological pattern that is told out through animals. So they're kind of uh, this mixture between animalistic behavior and human. And it's about a little bear who is uh, alone on his birthday to kind of amplify that he's really, really wanting company to stay and he's getting rejected both from some bears and some birds. And he finds out he can use his party hat as a bird disguise. So he tries to make company with birds. And uh, that is as much as I can tell without spoiling too much, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like you really like polar bears. Or, or this is a regular bear, it's not for This is a regular bear, or uh, a bit long stretched bears, mm. this <laughs> forest bear. They are um, uh, nice animals, I think, because they are um, teddy bears. They are something that is related to something soft and, uh, and safe, but they're also something you need to learn how to behave if you meet someone in the forest not to be killed so it's kind of like contradicting animal i think but, uh, sure. it's showing a wide spectrum of emotions and i think it's nice symbolic animal in that sense it's also um kind of uh, how to say royal animal maybe that you yeah. look up to it or it's it's like high in the hierarchy of the forest so yeah yeah, I think it's um, easy to give it human qualities. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's um, has been a very interesting topic to explore about loneliness and about what happens if you go against your own um, nature again. But yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, when is the film coming out? Do you, do you have already a date or you're still working on so you don't know? I just finished uh, shooting and I'm working on the post-production now. Sound and uh, music is going to be made during the summer. So we hope to finish it already uh, late summer, I guess, mm -hmm. if uh, everything goes as... It's been really strange because I live in France now and, uh, and that we managed to make it um, in the middle of this pandemic, it's kind of... Yeah, did, uh, did, did you use the same, uh, I mean, like uh, Jakob, uh, like a September and October when things were still happening? Or uh, I was supposed to go to France in November and then everything shut down. So it was postponed until January, but all the puppets was made over Skype and, uh, or yeah, we communicated over Skype and. Zoom and um, then um, it's a studio called JPL here in France in the Rennes and they are super super nice people that are really skilled and they trans transformed the designs that I made into uh, 3D objects really really well much better than I could have done myself so I think it it has been uh, surprisingly easy to work during the pandemic and yeah it seems like a little oasis of filmmaking it feels yeah, like. that's great that's great to, to know you know at least on, on this side you know you can you can still find you know a good 
balance, work balance. Great. Yeah. Um, so shall we shall we go to Gunil? Um, would you like to tell us about your new project? Uh, yeah, I am working on a feature film. I mean, I mean, I suppose I'm in the writing stage, really. But um, it's uh, called Stone Life, and it's a mother-daughter story set in the California desert or in uh, Joshua Tree outside of LA. So um, uh, it's about a woman my age. She's 40 years old, and she's been running an alternative retreat in the desert for the last 10 years. And, and the film starts off when her parents in their 70s come to visit her uh, when she's 40. Um, and uh, quite suddenly uh, the father dies. Uh, I mean, after yeah, 24 hours kind of thing. And the two women, the mother and the daughter is kind of forced to, to go into depth of, of their relationship because they're kind of stuck there in the desert trying to plan uh, the father's funeral and whatnot and then he is not paid insurance and blah blah so he has to be kind of dealt with in the states it's too too expensive to to um, take him to Norway so this becomes very sort of confronting for the two women that that doesn't have a good relationship basically and they they I suppose it's about acceptance and 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 trying to, yeah, really get to know your child or, or to respect them, the choices that you made. I suppose it goes both ways, but um, I don't know, but being part of a generation that has had so many possibilities that we have had, you know, being able to travel the world and, and, and do all sorts of things. Um, it is also, uh, uh, <laughs> it is also nice to kind of stop along the way and, and see um what all those possibilities have made us become in a way um so yeah but like i said um it's a uh, in writing stage and uh, and sort of early financing stage okay yeah so do you think that you know the pandemic was a um a reflection point it was a pause in your work that you... uh, no i mean that i it was a <laughs> randomly very uh, I, I was finishing up uh, an animation feature film when the pandemic started mm -hmm. and again you know uh, we were very lucky because we were in the last stages uh, but it, I also think because we were animation you know it's like yeah, an animation has actually picked up um, quite a lot during the pandemic um, uh, because it is uh, I mean you know, nothing is easy these days, but uh, it's definitely difficult to deal with, you know, live uh, action sets. It's, it's at least uh, more difficult than 3D animation. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I was working on that. And then um, after that was finished, it was quite natural to go into writing mode where I was writing along at the same time as well. But uh, so I've been kind of writing <laughs> uh, during uh, Corona and in a way that that's been good, you know, I mean, nothing is good with Corona, but, but you know, um, it hasn't been the, the worst of, of challenges in that sense, you know. Sure, yeah. yeah uh, but but the, the film itself or the story itself has not been like affected by Corona, like how I tell it or what I talk about or. Okay. My question is quite a broad one for, for all, the, all the directors really, because I find that short films, um, they're kind of hidden gems and you have to sometimes really kind of scratch the surface to find uh, the, 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 the films and that. Are there places that, um, that you can go to where you can kind of discover more of these or continue to watch other pieces of work that you've all done? Um, and if not, has there ever been the consideration that, you know, we have all these streaming platforms now that surely there must be a time for short film to have a similar platform? Everyone is asking themselves this question. Everyone is saying, oh, the short films is short and sweet and it should be easy to distribute and everyone would want to see them. And But uh, it's, it's not really very well organized anywhere. And um, but maybe Vimeo, I don't know, that will be the best place to look at things. But at the same time, everything is not there at all. And uh, but there are short films a bit here and a bit there. And you know, the, the consistent kind of back-to-back uh, -back short film uh, collection. I don't know any of your others, if, if you have any suggestions. I'm trying to think like, like 
what Gunnar was saying was that Vimeo, obviously, I mean, that's a, that's a good one. I mean, from the ones that I'm aware of and have sort of been in contact with, uh, there's, there's, well, nowness to a certain extent, but it's uh, nowness.com, but, they, but it's, a, it's a smaller window in a way. Vimeo, I think, is broader. Uh, the short of the week and director's notes are two other kind of platforms. Uh, I think uh, that many things has been said already, but um, for example, like when Pixar showed short films before their feature films, I, I thought that was a great way to do it. And uh, I was in contact with some distribution company that suggested that for, uh, for Pearl Diver and that they would try to find thematically linked feature films to show the film before. And I, yeah, I think that's a nice way to get it into the mainstream audience, maybe. But um, I don't know. I think um, it's more interesting, maybe, that or that why people make short films and that uh, it's a uh, um, to the point. It's a format where you're more concentrated and it's simpler and it's more like. Absolutely. Well, I think we we got more or less all the questions and and um, and we really I, I really want to thank each one of you, um, you know, the filmmakers, especially, you know, for uh, taking the time and joining us tonight. Uh, also for the audience that, you know, you know, just a, a lovely audience that we have and they're coming back and they're new and uh, well, you know, just watch as many shorts as you can because they're great. <laughs> Very much everyone for joining us. Yeah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye bye now.